Hello everybody. Welcome to the second instalment in the Australian Centre's Critical Public Conversations Lecture Series for 2024. My name is Julia Hertz. I'm the Deputy Director of the Australian Centre. Before we go any further, I would like to introduce to you Ike, who will give our welcome to country. Thanks, Auntie Di. Thank you, Auntie Di, for your warm welcome to country. Our theme this year is sovereignty and solidarity, redefining belonging in so-called Australia, exploring questions of belonging, borders and place. The series will investigate how Australia's founding as a settler colony constrains capacities to welcome refugees to these shores. We will platform work that counters settler colonialism's paranoid insistence on binaries, boundaries and borders to uncover them as arbitrary and violent technologies of state power. This series intends to go beyond settler borders and explore the ways more humane, international, domestic and indeed interpersonal relations are bound to justice for First Nations. I'd like to introduce our host for today, Dr Andoni Pipologu. Andoni is the Hellenic Senior Lecturer in Global Diasporas and a Fellow at the Australian Centre. He grew up on Ngunnawal country and, is, and has um, Dottokanese and Cypriot um, heritage. And Donnie is a specialist in migration and ethnic history with a particular interest in the dynamics of whiteness and Greek diasporation in Australia. He works on historical connections between colonialism, racism and the formation of ethnic identities, as well as human movements between the Mediterranean and the Pacific. And Oni is passionate about inclusive historical practice and engagement with migrant communities. Before I pass over to Andoni, who will introduce our very special guest, Winnie Dunn, I'd like to remind the audience that you can submit questions via the Q&A function anytime throughout this presentation. And Donnie will be asking Winnie your questions at the end of their conversation. Thank you and over to you, Dr. And Donnie. Thank you, Julia. And uh, thank you, Auntie, for that beautiful Welcome. Um, as someone whose mother was born in British Cyprus, I think I've inherited a healthy distrust of colonialist regimes. And it's because of this inheritance that I'd like to acknowledge the Dunhura peoples, whose land I have the privilege to speak to you from today, here in a pristine alpine region in northeast Victoria. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging and recognise the ancient and ongoing presence, as well as the unique and continuing connection that Indigenous peoples holds to lands, waters and culture in this stunning region, but also across the country. Um, today, we have the pleasure to hear from Winnie Dunn to talk to her about her captivating debut novel, Dirt Poor Islanders. Winnie is a Tongan Australian writer, proudly from Mount Druitt, She's a uh, general manager of Sweatshop Literary Movement, um, a collective based, in West, based and sprung out of Western Sydney, which is devoted to empowering culturally and linguistically diverse communities through reading, writing and critical thinking. In her role, she's played a major um, contribution in providing, you know, research, training, mentoring, employment opportunities for emerging and established writers and art practitioners from Indigenous and non and people from non-English speaking backgrounds. She's contributed to a range of forums in her writing, The Guardian, The Griffith Review, Mianjin, just to name a few. And she's edited to the captivating collection of anthologies, her most notable being Sweatshop Women, Volumes 1 and 2, 
um, Straight Up Islander with SBS Voices in, in 2021. And my favourite, Another Australia um, with a firm press in 2022, which is an engrossing collection of savvy writers rethinking Australia via alternative lenses. Her novel, De Poor Islanders, which we'll get stuck into today, was supported by a Creative Australia grant. Just a little bit about the books before I ask Witty some questions. Dirt Poor Islanders is narrated by Meadow Reed. Um, and in a subtle reflective tone, Meadow, who is fully Tongan and fully white, and we might get stuck into how it's possible to be fully both, invites us into her childhood years in which the upholding of tradition, pudgy aunties, the sense of frangipani, the colours of bougainvillea, and trips to Maccas and uneaten manioc uh, take place in and around the house of Fio Feo Faaki in Mount Druid. And we'll talk about this house in a moment. We quickly learn via the grumpy racist gaze of an Anglo-white neighbour, appropriately and humorously named Shazza, that poverty and culture have many experience, uh, poverty and culture have many experiences in, in Meadows, Western Sydney. Meadow, due to her grandmother's nuanced migration journey, in which she married an English Scottish man and passed off for being Maori, the only Pacifica peoples exempt from the white Australia policy, is a member of what we could think of as a Tongan Australian aristocracy. That is because her grandmother um, is an early Tongan migrant who acquired Australian citizenship, she was able to enable the future journeys of family members to leave the Pacific and become Australian. Meadow is bookish and astutely aware of what in the book is perhaps the square is well described as a brown and browner cultural background and meadow but is a member of a gifted and talented class in her school where she meets waromi a clever indigenous pupil and the only other person of color in her writing class meadow is conscious of gender norms and how they can be broken this novel is about matriarchy it touches on grief it touches on fears of violence and it's conscious of the expectation placed on Islander women by the church. These are themes that are ever present throughout the pages. There's also this beautiful transgressive tomboyishness to Meadow, as well as a relationship to the teachings of a particular auntie who is pulled into a conventional marriage of convenience despite being a lesbian. Dirt Poor Islanders, for me, is a story about belonging to home, to family. It's a story about negotiating class and becoming aware of a diasporic sensibility, a sensibility that permits a weaving of both a here and a there, a sensibility that recognises multiple histories and varied connections to place. Yet underlying Dirt Poor Islanders is a gentle story of self-understanding, of self-discovery, uh, coming to of a proud self-consciousness. In other words, how someone, a young woman in this case, learns to be who they want to be. So, Winnie, uh, first of all, let me congratulate you on this beautiful uh, debut extravaganza. Um, congratulations also on bringing Pacifica Worlds to the Australian page, to allowing readers to see uh, an alternative view of what it means to be uh, Australian in its plurality. Um, I'd like to kind of touch, first of all, on the power of speaking to place and people in place. Um, I think the novel and your words beautifully encapsulate what we could think of as a suburban aesthetic from particular eyes. And 
by extension, I'm just I'm just going to note on a few of these key places that I think you eloquently, um, vividly capture. The first is the house of uh, Fio Ka'aki, Fio Ka'aki. Um, and perhaps you can tell us the meaning of that. You also tell us about this in another house, Eight Sugar Drive, and these are all set within Mount Druitt, Western Sydney, and of course the suburbs' relationship to the city at large, and the city's relationship, or the people's relationship, to what we could think of as the exclusivist um, politics of settler Australia. So, just an, an early question here to think about, but sharing with us how you came to write about and think critically about place and the people in those places. My Lord Lele, thank you, Anthonis, for such a um, beautiful um, introduction and, and such an in-depth and generous summary um, of Dirt Four Islanders. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and I was telling everyone before the webinar today that um, this is my first event um, as an author, which is quite um, surreal for me. Um, so, you know, Thank you, everyone, for your patience if I'm a bit <laughs> awestruck um, by the whole ordeal. Um, but, yeah, uh, first and foremost, um, I would like to acknowledge um, that I'm on a uh, Darug country, um, known colonially um, as Western Sydney. Um, I also want to recognise that sovereignty was never ceded and this was and um, always will be uh, Aboriginal land. And, you know... That's where I would like to start off with when we consider place and um, our place in place <laughs> um, as so-called um, Australians. And so um, you can you can only start off by kind of recognize, recognizing First Nations first. Um, but on a more personal note, uh, beyond that, um, I'm from Western Sydney, which is uh, the most densely populated region in Australia and therefore the most diverse. I think there's over um, 2 million people who speak um, way over 100 different languages. And so growing up in, growing up in such a um, large and um, eclectic region meant that I was... Um, I had the privilege and the experiences of, of growing up side by side um, with so many people um, from different cultures and it just be completely normalised um, in, in my life. And for Western Sydney in particular, in the suburb I grew, grew up in, Mount Druitt, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'll try to explain Mount Druitt to you <laughs> um, in a way that I hope everybody will understand. I don't know if anybody's seen... Um, or heard of the SBS um, series Struggle Street. So the first season of that was set in Mount Druitt. And just to kind of see how kind of the rest of Australia saw Mount Druitt, the suburb I grew up in, Struggle Street, it opens up to a very picturesque Sydney Harbour Bridge. It then zooms through uh, Sydney City, which is the most um, iconic city in Australia in the world. And then we move through um, the suburbs and then the opening credit ends on a street sign full of graffiti that says, welcome to Mount Druitt and then a fart noise place. <laughs> and to me growing up in Mount Druitt when I was young in that time, I, I often just felt like it was the far end of Sydney and it was something to kind of be ashamed of because of its status as something um, lowly and gross. Um, and so my intersections of race, class and gender um, was really informed by that kind of, uh, I would say, poverty lens that people saw Mount Druid in. And in writing Dirt Poor Islanders, you know, I really wanted to dismantle that stereotype that Struggle Street placed on, on my um, suburb and, and community, that um, it's actually a place that, you know, where the iconic kind of Tupac says that kind of roses grow from the concrete. And so that's why flowers are so um, entwined in Dirtmore Islanders, because there is kind of beauty in that, in that, um, in that madness and, 
and in that in in the places where people think that you know is the bar end of the country um and in particular uh with meadow reed in dirtmore islanders as you said and donna she does grow up in those uh she does grow up between two houses the house of fit aki which means to love one another um and then eight sugar drive which uh the name is actually um inspired by um the name Shug Avery in The Colour Purple, which was uh, a really phenomenal uh, inspirational piece of text for me when I was writing Don't Call Islanders. Um, and for me, the importance of Meta Reed or the significance of Meta Reed growing up between two houses for me really showcases or mirrors um, kind of the way that Tonga is set up. We don't really have suburbs, we have villages. And, and so it with Meta Reed and her family, when they when the grandmother migrated to Australia, kind of um, set herself um, in Sydney and she brought all of the Reed family over. Um, oh, she brought all of her um, family over from Tonga. Uh, it, it's kind of like she started setting up little villages um, in Western Sydney. Um, and so for me, I'm from the villages of Malapo, um, Golomatua, and Golonga. And similarly, like Meadow Reed, I'm also from Mount Druitt and Plumpton and now Fairfield in South West Sydney, where I live. And so for me, I really liked the mirroring of um, place that plays out in the Pacific Islander community. Um, that kind of mirrors our motherland, um, but in such a unique way. Mm. But I have I have a similar experience in a sense that like my mother's refugee family from Cyprus all sort of settled in the same area, you know, and in a way I grew up in Canberra, but we would visit Melbourne, and, but we would visit particular parts of Melbourne in which, you know, this this village life persisted that you could sort of jump from backyard to backyard in some ways and and i think this this is part of a story of chain migration how one individual or a set or a family can actually set up a chain of migration which then extends village life and extends culture into new places and surrounds and so in these places um, say, in the house of um, love one another. Um, we have five amazing characters, I think, amazing aunties, which you spell out really well. Like you you give us the kind of energy and differences of these aunties who are not married, um, who are particular types of women in their community and they're upholding culture in a particular type of way, which leads me to, to ask you also that the novel is um, layered with, with different languages and we could think about it I, 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 in our brief discussions before today, you know, that there are three languages operating at the same time here which points to also how um, uh, uh, despite the prevalence of a monolingual Australian culture, our everyday lives um, tell us otherwise. And so here, here there is, in a way, an Aussie English. There's a Tongan. And then there are is the, well, I would call it the, the street the street language of Western Sydney, but it's I, I it's also identifiable for me. So uh, it's not necessarily um, the kind of uh, there's a particularity of a, of a sort of a class language, a class operation of language. So I could you just speak to um, the challenge, if you will, of writing three types of languages into a cohesive whole? that um, feels comfortable and natural and you hope then the reader can pick up and grasp. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you say challenge because when I was 
writing Dirt Poor Islanders, I felt um, really privileged and quite excited at the idea that I could play with the three languages that I have access to um, quite easily and it create an original contribution to knowledge, which I think is what um, literature is or what good literature is, um, because um, in Australia, Tongan language and Tongan words um, haven't appeared on the page in the form of a novel um, until Dirt Poor Islanders. So um, I don't know if this sounds like I'm talking myself up a bit, but all I can say is that <laughs> um, I found ease moving through the three different languages of Tongan, uh, Western Sydney vernacular, um, and uh, kind of Aussie English because it's the it's the three languages um, that I have access to and I say access to because I don't actually speak um, Tongan so I want to take a moment to thank the author um, of the first Tongan Australian children's book um, I am Lupe, um, Sela Aposivi Atiola. Um, she really really helped me <laughs> kind of nail the Tongan um, as much as I could and, and again it just shows that kind of community like a a book is not made um, in in uh, in a silo or in solitude. It's it's made in stories are made in community, and you know um, Tongans in particular and Pacific Islanders in particular have known that for a long time, which is why we're known for this kind of structure of Dalanoa, which is when you sit in a circle and you're kind of talking and discussing and telling stories to each other without the pressure of uh, a conclusion. Um, or the pressure of um, resolving something. It's just the act of storytelling and the act of um, discussion um, that actually brings forth um, healing um, and understanding, um, which for me, which is why I really loved writing Dirt Poor Islanders because I felt like I was um, tapping into that part of my culture. Um, and in saying that for me, what Aussie English, Western Sydney vernacular, and the Tongan language have in common is for me metaphors and alliteration. Um, Tongans, the Tongan language is structured in a way where you're always talking through something. So you're always talking through the symbol of a flower or um, the symbol of a bird or um, how plants grow in order to communicate what it is you're saying. Um, and in the same way, uh, Western um, Sydney vernacular and slang uh, is quite amazing at alliteration. One of my favorite saves is dumb, dirty dog, <laughs> um, which I think is quite a profound and beautiful way to kind of use language and insults um, that I have in my community. Uh, and then again, um, kind of Australian English as well is kind of this um, butchered, playful version of colonial British English, um, which, you know, we, which, you know, English is not the language of this complicated continent. But what I will say is that kind of very um, bastardized version of English in Australia is actually quite fun. And it's recognized as um, quite unique um, across the globe. And so, yeah, languages um, and using it to create original contributions to knowledge um, was such a joy when writing Jeff Moore Islanders. So would you say you in how would you how would you consider I know you've asked this to other writers so I'm going to ask it to you is 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 sort of like the the ethics of language use um to your practice you know like what drives you to expand our vocabulary so to speak I think what drives me to extend our vocabulary um, is the fact that, you know, the purpose of literature, and I, I think the purpose of um, being a writer is to give people new knowledge. Um, and if you're not doing that in your, in your writing practice, um, I'm not actually really sure what it's for other than I think kind of fulfilling some self desire, which is fine to a certain extent, but in terms of reshaping what we know about ourselves, what we, what we know about um, this complicated continent um, and how we've 
thought about um, our continent, our complicated continent in the past, I think is why I write and um, why it was very important to me and I felt that deep responsibility to write um, a Tongan Australian story because, you know, as we know, the only Tongan Australian mainstream narrative um, that Australia has had um, access to, unfortunately, um, is Chris Lilly um, and his mockumentaries, Summer Heights High and Jonah from Tonga. And we all, we all know that Chris Lilly is an Anglo-Saxon Australian comedian um, who put on brown face, an Afro wig, uh, a thick accent, and enacted these really violent, hypersexual and illiterate depictions of Tongan Australian children um, and in, in, in a broader sense, Pacifica Australian children. Like I think people often forget he played a young boy in year seven. Um, and it was just absolutely devastating um, to my sense of self because when I saw um, Summer Heights High for the first time over a decade ago, I, I, I understood as a 14 year old that this country looked at me and people like me um, as stupid and a joke um, and as something to be made fun of. And so Dirtmore Islanders really to me was a kind of reclamation um, of that narrative, you know, and it really goes to show the importance of own, own voices storytelling and why, why it's actually important to, for me as a Tongan Australian, to be able to have the freedom and the access to write a Tongan Australian story and it be taken um, seriously as a form of um, literature because the alternative at the moment is just Chris Lilly. And I know Australia as a nation um, has moved past that um, and is wanting to move past that. And so, you know, I hope that, you know, Dirt Poor Islanders, you know, is that new access point um, for Australia to relearn um, what he understands about Tongan Australians and the Pacific Australian community more broadly. And I think the novel absolutely does that. Um, and one of the powerful ways that it does that is through its structure. It's divided into four parts. Um, which are titled Soil, Bark, Salt, and I. that's my sort of favourite um, structuring, the salt bit. We, maybe we, you can talk to that, and, and blood. And uh, setting up each, each subsection, each section, is what we could think of as kind of short, short stories of Tongan mythology, ancient Tongan stories. Um, which allow us new knowledges, which allow us an entry into kind of spirituality as well as relation between spirit and country um, in a new way. So could you speak to those mythologies, but also perhaps to um, whether these were stories or narratives that were passed on to you or they something that you've had to learn? something that I think a lot of diasporic cultures, you know, those that are situated away from the homeland, so to speak, real or imagined, um, uh, know are there but not, do not necessarily have access to because they're, 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 there is a sort of, they, they are scattered and removed from, from those worlds. Yeah, so... Um, thank you for noting um, the structure because it, it's something that I put um, a lot of thought in. And, you know, when I'm, you know, as somebody who is also um, mixed race, I'm constantly being broken down um, into percentages, you know, what part of me is Anglo, uh, what part of me is uh, Tongan. And, you know, people are often shocked when I tell them that um, both my parents are um, a mixed race so um they're both part Tongan and part white because uh, people often assume that I I have a, a white parent um but I'm actually I think one of the few um what Tongans call upper caste half caste um that actually grew up with no um white relatives so um like Meadow Reed I was raised um Tongan um by Tongans who were all different um, shades. And so when I was structuring the novel into soil, bark, salt, and blood, it was me trying to 
actually break down, well, what what do I understand being Tongan to be? Like what are the elements or the percentages, I would say, that actually make up being Tongan? And for me, it was those four central components that kind of make up our land and our skin um, and our way of being. Um, and it kind of all comes together um, at the end um, of the novel, um, which I, I hate saying this. It sounds really wanky. I won't spoil it, but <laughs> all those elements that what I think for me being Pacific Islander is comes together um, at the end of the novel. And I made a conscious decision to open up each section um, with a Tongan myth story uh, for multiple reasons. Um, the first reason um, is to for the Australian community to have a deeper understanding of Tongan Australian culture uh, and really the Tongan part of that hyphen because again the only representation um, is Chris Lilly and even in even in um, Jonah from Tonga where he actually goes to Tonga it's it's very strange and not actually at all how Tongans experience Tonga when you know they quote unquote go back or visit so to say and so like again it was that responsibility of like um you know Australia has a fundamentally um damaging misunderstanding of the Tongan Australian community so how can I give um as much information as possible uh but in a in a kind of way that is still lends itself to the beauty um, of fiction and actually entices readers to want to keep reading uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's a book. Um, secondly, it's because Dirtmore Islanders is actually written in the past tense and it's very, very subtle, but the idea is that an older Meadow Reed is reflecting back um, on her younger years as a writer. And, and honestly, when we were talking be before, it was just funny that you said, oh, like I that makes so much sense because Meadow Reed is actually, she's so articulate and she's so, she's thinking way more in depth than probably an 11 year old ever does. <laughs> and so if anybody reads Dirt Poor Islanders and thinks that, it is because of that past tense. Um, and this older Meadow Reed, who's kind of in the shadows in the background, has actually interspersed the Tongan myth stories um, in between this novel that she's written. Um, because an older Meadow Reed can see and reflect on the fact that these ancient stories from thousands of years ago um, actually informs the way Tongan Australians live their life in Australia. And again, it's, it's kind of that reflection um, of culture and homeland in a land that we live on um, that was never ceded. So there was that element to that. Um, and also the third one is it was actually my way <laughs> of apologizing and appreciating um, my auntie, who the book is dedicated to, uh, Winnie, who I named after. Uh, for a very long time, when I was very young, um, she tried to teach me the Tongan language. She tried to get me to um, appreciate these myth stories that were actually quite secretive. Like we weren't actually meant to be talking about these stories because of colonial Christianity. And the fact that because Tonga, in my opinion, was colonized not through land, but through Christianity, that we actually, Tongans actually refer to um, ancient myth stories as the darkness and Christianity as the lightness. And so for me, it was a way of kind of positioning myself when you've done the right job. Um, one, apologizing to my aunt and saying, I actually appreciate these stories now, thank you. Um, and two, really wanting other Tongans who were like me, or like other Tongan Australians who were like me back in the day when I was ashamed of being Tongan and when I didn't want to learn anything and when I thought it was all silly and when I thought that was darkness, um, that that our, our 
ancient culture and our ancient myths, whatever religion you are, um, is still something to be proud of and is still um, knowledge to be gained and knowledge to have access to um, and that it actually does inform the way that we live our lives and it's it's something to be proud of. Thanks. I'm, I'm just going to invite people to throw questions into the Q&A. Um, and there's already one in there which sort of is attached to one of the final questions I was going to ask you, Winnie. Um, and by way of getting there, I might I might say here I'm already hearing, you know, as I'm thinking critically with you. I hope that there's there's a whole series of returns going on. There's there is an older self returning to her younger self. There's a return to the stories of a culture that has that is been at least at least in a physical sense disconnected from its origins um and through this um and then i i guess so there there is another sense of return which comes at the later part of the novel which you've sort of touched on in the awfulness of chris lily's representation of tongan australian culture but there's a return right to tonga that takes place and so here, attached to the question that's been asked is to, for us to think about the value of autobiographical writing as a, as a form, a genuine um, and, and powerful form of fiction. And the balance between using facts and reality and crafting um, fiction into our, into our life worlds, if that makes sense. So, so sort of like another form of return going on in the sense of a life lived. So this is this is genuine, um, powerful autobiographical fiction and your ability to, to return to moments in your life, reflect on them and integrate that into the story. So it's kind of two, two points here I want to ask. One is an encompassing one about the value of autobiographical fiction. And then the other one then is the powerful realizations that can occur when uh, diaspora is an interesting term um, in, in its origins, in, in its language. You know, it, it means in a way dispersal. I like to think of the metaphor of a, a scattering of seeds. It can happen randomly, but then these seeds can grow and nurture other seeds. So a dispersal of people away from some kind of origin. And in that occurs a desire, sometimes a lived reality, of return. So, so part, of, part of this autobiographical value, I also just want you to perhaps share with us your returns to Tonga at different stage in your life and how that then has influenced your, your thinking. Yeah, so... I think I will first answer the question through that um, lens of um, autobiographical fiction. So um, autobiographical fiction in, in the title, it's fiction inspired by the writer's life. Uh, but for me, and uh, a really potent lesson um, I learned um, as a writer and editor um, at Sweatshop uh, Literacy Movement is that all forms of writing are autobiographical fiction. So my favourite example to use because it's so well known um, is uh, Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling. So, um, and contentious in other areas, but let's not go there. <laughs> um, you know, Har uh, Hogwarts and the Wizarding World is as mythical and as magical as you're going to get, right? But in that, we can see kind of J.K. Rowling's lived experience come through um, Harry, the Harry Potter narrative. I mean, it's a it's a white person who grew up in England. Um, it's focused in England and Britain as a whole, um, and you know the the way that she even sets up um, certain um, characters like Cho Chang, for example, kind of reveals to the reader how J.K. Rowling and kind of I I would feel white British people in general tend to uh, marginalise or box uh, people of colour. 
uh, but a kind of accessible uh, example of what I mean when I say Harry Potter is a form of autobiographical fiction is the Dementor characters. Um, there's plenty of interviews where J.K. Rowling talks about the fact that her mother died uh, while she was writing The Prisoner of Azkaban. And then she created the figures of the Dementors as a metaphor for the grief that she was experiencing um, during that time. So we can see in something as mythical and magical as Harry Potter and Hogwarts um, that J.K. Rowling's lived experience still inform the, the literature, the fiction. Um, so for me, it's it's a autobiographical fiction is just a is just a title for people to grab onto, but I actually just think it's just all forms of creative writing because our imagination is actually limited to what we know. I think there's this myth that our imagination is limitless and you can hop into anyone's shoes and you can do whatever you want. And um it's just not it's just not the reality of how human beings actually experience the world. We experience it through ourselves and we can only ever really understand um, the world through our own lived experiences. And so, um, yeah, that's why for me, Dirt Poor Islanders, you know, is, is a fictional representation of my life is because one, I just think that's all forms of fiction, but two, Again, it comes back to that responsibility of, you know, the only mainstream narrative um, was Chris Lilly. And so it was that responsibility of what Bell, um, the African-American feminist and scholar Bell Hooks um, talks about um, the empowerment of moving from margin to centre um, as a revolutionary gesture. So it was about moving the Tongan, narr Tongan Australian narrative into um, the centre uh, because it, it had been marginalised for so long. And then in terms of Tonga and what it means for me and the kind of similarities and differences as to what it means and represents for Meadow Reed, um, all I can say, again, without spoiling too much, is that I was very conscious of the fact that when Meadow Reed um, goes to Tonga with her grandmother um, and her aunt, I'm, I made sure that she discovered a lot about her family, a lot about herself, but she actually didn't come of age in Tonga because I didn't want to go into that kind of cliche narrative of I went to the mother country and I just learned everything about myself. I'm, I'm amazing now um, because I think that's also kind of, I mean, it's cliche, but it's also a myth as well that I think that happens. So I was just very conscious of the fact that Meadow Reed actually comes of age, you know, back home in Mount Druitt, you know, where she was born and raised. Um, and the fictional element of that kind of going to Tonga, uh, Meadow Reed's journey there, um, is the fact that for me, Winnie Dunn as the writer, um, I feel like I got to experience Tonga twice for the first time. So the first time I went is when I was 14. And it was the first time that I actually just found out what a third world country actually is. Um, and I just, I just couldn't believe there was no such thing as a paved road that you could drive on. I, I really couldn't understand it was just dirt. <laughs> um, but in and I couldn't understand that when I went to go um, sleep in my grandmother's village in her house, there was just lizards everywhere. Not being cognizant of the fa of the fact that back home in Mount Druitt, you know, the house that I grew up in with my siblings was full of cockroaches. So like, really, what was the difference? <laughs> what was the difference there? Um, and also these differences in poverty and class, you know, um, Meta Reed is very conscious of the fact that her head is kind of infested with myths, but when she goes to Tonga, these seemingly third world people are the kind of cleanest Tongans she's ever come across. Like they're, you know, they're myth free. Like she literally says that. Um, and so, you know, there's that element in Meta Reed's journey, but then she, is taken around Tonga by her um, maternal, um, her paternal aunt, um, and is shown all the historical landmarks. And she comes, she comes to realize the kind of beauty underneath that dirt and dust um, of being Tongan and what being Tongan means. And that was my experience when I got to go to Tonga when I turned twenty one, which is the age that Tongans consider you an adult. Um, and I actually asked to go. And my auntie, who I met, she took me as well. And um, it was that 
again, it was that kind of act of reclamation. Like I, I want to go to Tonga, not for Tonga to inform um, my experience, but um, for my experiences to inform the way that I see Tonga um, and to be empowered by that rather than disempowered as Chris Lily would like me to think. Um, thank you, Winnie. I'm conscious of time, so I've, there's a couple of questions that are fantastic that we might get to in, in rapid succession. One, which is a, always a great question, I think, for writers, is how did you come, your first lines in the novel are being described here as brilliant and powerful, right? And how did you, the, how did you come, how did you arrive to your first line? Um, I can share that there's two ways we could say these two lines because there's there's the the first line of the myth in the first part of the of the of soil, which is blood soaked soil as flesh of flesh become full form. And then um there's after after the myth stories, speak English, you savage. Um are these were these easy to come to? Um, no, first lines are very, very hard uh, because, again, I really set the standard of making that original contribution um, to knowledge. And so, you know, I it took me many years to come up with the first lines because I wanted it to be um, as original as my kind of skill set at the time um, could make it. And for me, the first word is actually not the sentence it's the um it's the what tom is called for e hair for e hair i think oh my gosh my auntie's watching this so she's, she's gonna <laughs> uh, but it's it's an it's a tongue and knuckle pattern that actually showcases um the three different types of plantings of um dalo manioke and ufi and for me, that was a celebration of the fact that, you know, Tongan storytelling um, wasn't actually written down in words. Um, it was actually used through symbolism and metaphor that we painted on a, a kind of paper bar um, map to kind of relay our histories and our stories and our connections to each other and to, and to land. And so for me, it's that marking straight away at the top that opens the novel. And then... Um, uh, blood soaked soil as flesh of flesh became full form for me um, relates to the fact that I think being Tongan and understanding yourself in your culture does relate to blood in one way or another um, and that kind of connection there but also it's it's a birthing story so it's actually the birthing or the birthing of the book <laughs> that happens um, in that first line and you know I hope readers catch on to the fact that um, at the end of the novel um, you know blood appears again and there's a kind of mirroring of the first line and and the last lines. Well we have one more question here I think enough time for one more which is from someone from so-called Canada who's asking us how we might think about Dirt Paul Islanders, and so it's probably back to front here with this beautiful cover, um, within a kind of diasporic context, transnational context. So without trying to flatten out the beauty and specificity of the story here between Tonga and Australia, between an Indigenous First Nations country and Tonga ex Tongan experience, how might the book... Um, speak to readers who could relate to a diasporicness um, without fully understanding the specificity here. Um, and I, I'll just I'll just add here that um, what I find really important comes from a work by Gassan Haj's latest work of the diasporic condition is to think about um, what he calls lenticular realities, that it's possible to live in multiple realities while being in one space. And this allows us to think through the containment of the national space. But I'll pass over to you. Yeah, I mean, that's such an interesting question because I think there's a, a, a kind of 
myth or misunderstanding that because a story is so specific, it actually cuts people out. My my response to that is that no, it's actually so specific that it actually draws people in because readers are able to um, latch on to kind of the universal parts of that specificity, but also appreciate that specificity. Like um, because it's very hard to grasp onto a broad idea of uh, let's say like um let's say like a kind of racist person that you grew up around like we all have kind of those different experiences right but you know and harking back to the aptly named Shazza the Bogan um <laughs> who helps um open this open um dirt for islanders the story in Mount Druitt um for me it's like if I'm so specific about this certain kind of racism, it actually relates back to kind of what, you know, First Nations people in so-called Canada are experiencing, you know, in that form of racism uh, and, you know, what Indigenous people here um, experience, you know. And so for me, it's the specificity that actually enables you to come into the story in a much more um, empathetic and nuanced way. Um, and it, it, it helps the reader to then find those universal messages that then relate back to their own lived experience. Thanks, Winnie. And I just might, I might say that the Dirt Poor Islanders, apart from being an extremely accessible and engaging read, that it really is a page turner and you should all go get your hands on it, is I really do. Um, Melissa uh, Lukashenko writes in in her endorsement. You know, it really is an exploration of a particular type of community, and we can think about this Tongan Australian community and the hyphen that kind of exists there um, as universal. I, you know, that there's diasporic sensibility which I sort of opened with that I speak that I think speaks to many different diasporic cultures, whether it be in so-called Canada or here. There's a way of thinking about negotiation of different cultures within a place that doesn't recognize or doesn't fully embrace, let's say, in a kind of structural sense, um, a, a, a one a, a, a what it means to be multiple, if that makes sense. And yet we all are, and there's 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 immense power in then thinking about dirt poor islanders as yes, a powerful Pacifica um, novel, but also a powerful diasporic novel that maybe crosses borders as well, like crosses borders and can be read and picked up across the world. Thanks, um, I might leave it there, but I would just like to say thank you, Winnie. This is a brilliant novel um, and um, it opens new avenues for us to see Australia in new lights. Yeah. And just quickly for anybody who's interested, I do have a couple of book launches coming up. Uh, one in uh, Sydney, um, 11th of April with Armani Haya. And for those of you in Melbourne or Nam um, who want to come and see me in person and maybe get your book signed, um, I'll be launching Dirt Poor Islanders at Readings Carlton uh, with the amazing Evelyn Arlewin. Uh, so please pop by uh, if you have time. Thank you, Winnie, and thank you, and Donnie, so much. Winnie, we can put the dates out via our um, channels so we can advertise those dates for you. The next CPC will be on Wednesday, the 25th of August from 12 to 1. Um, the presentation is titled Gaps in Our Histories with the wonderful human Maxine Benneba Clark. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you again. Congratulations, Winnie, and thank you, Andoni. Um, it's wonderful to see you all, and we will see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Winnie.